It is March 1st, a brand new month. So I have to ask, is March coming in like a lion where you live? If that's the case, you may want to get Val Kilmer and Michael Douglas on your side. Or is the weather on the first day of March kind of lambish already where you live? I don't know. I can't tell you. All I can tell you for certain is the Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I am Jeff McAleer. I'm back once again as your host here at The Daily Dope, as well as happening to be the grand poobah of the GamingGang.com. So settle on in. It is March 1st, 2018. I've got a big show ahead. I do want to point out chat is available. It's available on Twitch as well as YouTube. So if you want to chime in, if you want to say hello, uh, when I'm doing my review of Hero Realms in just a bit, if you have a question about that or want to see a closer look at something, feel free to ask. All right. So, wow. March 1st already. Jeez, boy, I'm telling you, this year is just flying past. I have to say, pretty good month overall uh, for the Daily Dope as well as the GamingGang.com. So... 20 episodes of the Daily Dope for the month. 10 of them were reviews, so that is pretty wild. I, I swear, I keep saying I'm doing more reviews doing this daily show than I ever did as far as doing written reviews on the gaming gang itself. But uh, also a pretty stellar month as far as the gaming gang. I track, you know, our traffic, unique visitors, things like that over the years. And 2018 looks like it was uh, the best February ever for visitors to thegaminggang.com. Numbers, uh, numbers aren't completely in yet. I don't have numbers in for yesterday yet, but it looks as if the Gaming Gang pulled in almost 90,000 unique visitors last month. So that's pretty cool. And if you're not familiar with that term, what a unique visitor is, is uh, you're counted the first time you would visit the GamingGang.com for the month. So you would be considered a unique visitor. Now, if you happen to stop by twice a day or you stop by, say, five times in the month, you're still only counted once as a unique visitor. So pretty wild. I guess a lot of people don't realize that the Gaming Gang actually pulls in well over a million unique visitors a year. Kind of cool. All right. So anyway, I've got a jam-packed show today. As I mentioned already, in just a bit, I am going to review Hero Realms from White Wizard Games. And uh, I also have a few of the character decks as well as boss decks that I'm going to talk about as well. Uh, quite a bit of news. I've got some opinion that I'm going to share on my last news piece. And uh, I've got a couple of real quick items from the mailbag as well. And, uh, of course, I'll talk about what uh, what's on tomorrow's show and what might be cooking for next week. So, all right, without further ado, let's jump into the news because there is a Gen Con release that's coming from Luma Games and Holy Grail Games. I guess they've teamed up for the release of a board game called Museum. Hmm. Can we guess what the subject matter of this game might be? Well, there's no guessing involved because I've got the dope. It's the turn of the 20th century, the golden age of museums. As interest in an accessibility uh, excuse me, accessibility of museums grew exponentially, many institutions underwent an intense period of expansion on both an intellectual and physical level, searching to grow their collections for profit and science. You play as a curator of one such museum, and it's your job to build the biggest, most coherent collection that you can in this game of collection and bartering Feature featuring over 300 
individual illustrations by Vincent Durait, Dutrait, and authentic archaeological facts. But it's no simple task. Each player in museum has a small collection of relics to get them started, after which they will have to send explorers around the world to uncover others. Come on, Dr. Jones, we need you. These relics each have a value, which is either the cost to add them to your museum or how much they contribute toward adding other relics to your museum. Spent relics are added to your reserve. You can withdraw them from it by exchanging them for an equal amount of items. However, your opponents also have access to your reserve. During the game, you will be required to assemble different collections. These can be from different categories, war, agriculture, architecture, etc., or periods, ancient Egypt, Rome, Aztec, etc. Patron cards will give you bonus cards for amassing certain collections. Explorer cards will allow you to hire famous archaeologists, uh, say like Dr. Jones. No, I'm sure uh, Indy's not included in this game. To confer bonuses to your museum, and event cards will provide you with some game-changing circumstances that you'll have to work around based on historical events. All these different elements make compiling your collection an interesting and sometimes tricky experience. At the end of the game, points are scored based on collections and their value, and the player with the most points wins. Museum is for two to four players, ages 12 and up, and plays in around 30 to 60 minutes. Uh huh. Because this is pretty far off, uh, we're talking a Gen Con release, so we're talking August. And then sometimes games that release at Gen Con don't actually make their way into your friendly local game store until the month after. No MSRP. So I don't know what the cost will be. Pretty cool that there's 300 unique illustrations in the game. Nice. And I always like games that have kind of a historical flair to them as well. Speaking of historical flair, or maybe I should say mm, scientific flair, if you find the core, core games of, say, evolution or evolution climate from North Star Games a tad daunting, well, you're going to be in luck because you will soon be able to pick up, in fact, soon as in today, evolution the beginning. And I've got the dope from North Star. In Evolution the Beginning, you'll adapt your species to succeed in a dynamic ecosystem where food is scarce and predators roam. That's right, yes, because the predators have landed and they've got all their weapons and... Oh, wait, no, uh, that'd be a different game. Traits like flight and horns will protect your species from carnivores, while a long neck will help them get food that others cannot reach. With hundreds of ways to evolve your species, every game unfolds in a beautifully unique way. Evolution the Beginning borrows ideas and concepts from other games in the Evolution branded product line, but it is a standalone game that is not compatible with anything else in the Evolution product line. It is the most casual and quick playing adaptation of the Evolution concept, but it is still a highly strategic two-player game. It is for more than two players, though, because Evolution the Beginning is for two to five players. It's ages eight and up, plays in around 30 to 40 minutes. You can snag this introductory title to the Evolution line right now at an MSRP of $24.99. Very nicely done, North Star Games. Now, I will want to point out that uh, Evolution the Beginning did originally come out, I want to say 2016, but it's been out of print, so now it's back. And I gotta say, I think Evolution's really cool. I think it's an excellent game. You know what? I don't know what exactly I was gonna do on Monday or Tuesday's show, so I think... I got it right here. There we go. I will actually break out Evolution either on Monday or Tuesday. I will, uh... Because if you follow the Daily Dope, if you, yeah, if you catch the show every once in a while, or... Maybe you watch it every day. 
I always tweet the night before what's going to be on the next day's show, especially what the featured game is, of course. You know what? I think I will actually do a review of Evolution on either Monday or Tuesday's show. Cool. So I will add that uh, kind of to the list. I'll put that off to the side because I don't... Uh, I reviewed Evolution a long time ago, but it was a written review. So yeah, you know what? I think I will do that. I will do that for North Star Games because Bruce and Luke and the rest of the gang are always very, very cool over there. So stay tuned for that next week. All right, so I have been talking how Renegade Game Studios have been quiet for a little while, and then this week we got all these different game releases announced. And there was a third one, and I do want to mention that Lucidity Six-Sided Nightmares is coming in April. Probably April. And I've got the dope. Lucidity Six-Sided Nightmares is a press-your-luck dice collection and manipulation game for two to four players. It takes less than a minute to learn and 20 to 30 minutes to play. Whenever you close your eyes, you fall into the dream world. Oh, I'm sorry, dream realm. A world of vivid hallucinations and dark monsters. Oh, I wonder if that's what was going on with uh, Tom Hanks in the Dungeon Master movie. You must use your wits to draw power from the dream realm and break its hold on you before the monsters can track you down and consume you. Each turn, you randomly draw a number of dice from a shared bag. This represents the dreams you will encounter this turn. Return two to the bag to represent your chosen path through the dream realm and roll the remainder. After you have suffered the effects of your roll, you must choose whether to rest and clear your card of one or two dreams or press on and try your luck on another turn, going deeper and rolling more dice every time you do so. You win by collecting 15 power symbols on your rolled dice, freeing yourself from the dream world's grasp. But if you collect too many of the wrong symbols, you may find yourself twisted and turned by the monsters until you too become a dreaded nightmare or something's dinner. Should you become a nightmare, your game completely changes. You can still win, but only by consuming the dreams of the remaining dreamers, or sending minions after them to prevent them from becoming more powerful than you. Damn you, dreamers! If nobody has escaped by the end of the game, the most powerful nightmare is the victor. Without dreams, you cannot win, but without control, you risk becoming that which you fear most. Or maybe that was your plan all along. Lucidity Six-Sided Nightmares is for two to four players, ages 14 and up. Obviously, I would think mainly for the subject matter, but of course it does have a bunch of dice. And plays in around 20 to 30 minutes. The MSRP is $30 and the title should arrive sometime in April. Although I have no concrete release date yet because as far as I understand, this was kickstarted. So Kickstarter backers are going to make sure that they get their copies ahead of time. Lucidity Six-Sided Nightmares does sound pretty unique, pretty different. Hey, Russell Higgins is chiming in. Hello, Russell. Russell tends to watch just about every show, a lot of times live. Sup, sup is what uh, Russell is saying and uh, not much, just jumping into the news today. All right, so there is, uh, you know what? Let me grab a sip real quick. There is a new Kickstarter that is pretty much blowing up on Kickstarter. It is from Monolith Editions, and it is Batman Gotham City Chronicles, and it's loaded down with miniatures, and this is just, I'm telling you right now, this is huge. And of course... I've got the dope. In Batman Gotham City Chronicles, one villain faces off against a team of heroes in one of multiple scenarios. Each hero has, excuse me, each hero has their own character and they control this character by spending energy to perform actions such as melee and ranged attacks, defusing bombs, and so on. Recovering more or less energy at the beginning of their turn depending on their stance. If the hero gets damaged, energy moves to a wound area, and if they lose all of their energy, 
Then they're out of action for a while to recover their strength. Each hero has differing strengths for their abilities, and these strengths are represented by colored dice with different values. The more energy a hero spends on an ability, the more dice of that color they can roll. The villain controls a team of henchmen and iconic villains of the Batman universe. And these characters are represented by tiles on their command board, with the characters costing 1, 2, 3, etc. energy to activate as you move left or right down the line. Once, char once a character is activated, they move to the end of the line, boosting their cost to the maximum value should you want to use them again immediately, and decreasing the cost of other tiles. The gameplay in Batman Gotham City Chronicles is based on that of Conan, also from Monolith, with revisions to character abilities, the addition of two different types of dice with five types total, and a modified two-player setup, the Versus mode, in which each player has a command board and their own team of tiles that they can draft, with heroes facing off against villains. This Kickstarter has already achieved, wait for it, ready? $2.3 million in funding, and you can reserve a copy of the base game, which consists of the heroes and villains boxes, plus all unlocked stretch goals for $140. There's also a deluxe pledge level of $320 that has just a slew of different expansions. So, Russell has pointed out it is so tempting, but I have sworn off Kickstarters. Well, Russell, you're probably tuning into the right episode today because I'm going to talk about a Kickstarter disaster in just a moment. But it's interesting that Russell points this out because this does look pretty phenomenal and it is just jam-packed with miniatures because not only are there heroes and villains, there are civilians and henchmen and allies, and there's just loads and loads of minis. There are all these stretch goals for more miniatures, more characters that have unlocked. Pretty cool. Now, I do have to point out, from my understanding, Monolith Editions they did deliver their Conan game, but it was really, really late. And I do understand there were people who were very unhappy with some of the sculpts of the miniatures. On the flip side of that, I hear the gameplay of Conan is actually really good. So it's a really good game. But then I have to toss in that Monolith was supposed to do an app as one of the stretch goals and there's no sign of the app for the game and i guess the folks at monolith editions aren't even talking about it anymore so i'm just sharing this news piece because it does look cool as i pointed out it's at about 2.3 million dollars in funding and i want to say it launched a day or two ago at most because i think there's 30 days left to the kickstarter so it is something you may want to go check out. You may want to take a peek. I have provided you uh, a bit of, uh, I guess I would say, caveats about Monolith and their past. They have they have delivered the game. So they, they have delivered Conan. Uh, there's another one. I think it's called Mythic Pantheons. I don't know anything about that. So Monolith has released, like I think, two or three other games besides this. So I'm just sharing it, but I am trying to arm you with some knowledge as well. All right, so on Thursdays, I like to always talk about RPGs. Now, unfortunately, I'm not done combing through Savage Worlds of Flash Gordon to provide you a review, but I'm doing Hero Realms. It's a fantasy card game. It's, But I did want to share some RPG news. And if you're like a lot of game masters, Sometimes you've got just the, the greatest elements for your campaign or your adventures and that, but then you find certain areas you don't have enough detail. You need some more to flesh it all out. Well, the latest RPG release has arrived from Loresmith, and this time the company is looking at taverns and inns to give you a hand in bringing them to life in your fantasy RPGs. And I've got the dope. 
Remarkable Inns and their drinks is the definitive guide to taverns. Okay, those are their words. How to create your own and bring them to life. This richly detailed 88-page tome offers a wealth of new gameplay options. Eight ready-made taverns, NPCs, rumors, secrets, and over 1,000 random list options. I'm not super keen on random stuff, but hey, you know, when you're trying to put it all together. Anyway, what are you waiting for? Step inside. Turn an ordinary tavern visit into remarkable, exciting role-playing experiences. Need some inspiration for bar brawls, particular games of chance, innkeeper mannerisms? This book has it all and more. Chronicled by the famous adventurer Quilla Bladesong, can't be that famous, I've never heard of Quilla, you will discover famous places such as the North Call Inn, Fizz Nozzle's Hall of Wonders, and the King's Coin. Each includes relevant NPCs and a number of secrets and rumors that provide story hooks for many new adventures. Each tavern is written so that it can easily be dropped into your existing campaign world and become a place your players love returning to time and again. It includes 88 pages of rich, inspirational content compatible with any role-playing system. Uh, I guess some things are kind of tuned more towards 5th edition. As already mentioned, there are eight ready-made famous taverns and their history, NPCs, story hooks, rumors, foods and drinks, plus optional new gameplay rules, an entire section about creating your own taverns as well. Plus, I did mention the thousand options through random generation tables. If you love creating your own wonderful places, Remarkable Inns and Their Drinks provides you with a wealth of inspiration and options. There are complete sections full to the brim with generation tables, lists, and ideas to create and populate your taverns. They range from the types of drinks to be served, the variable exotic dishes, memorable features, and a list of 100 more story hooks for your taverns. It includes a range of exciting optional gameplay rules too to put new spins on otherwise ordinary tavern visits. Mm hmm. So I have to point out the 88 page PDF is available normally for $9.99 on Drive-Thru RPG. But Drive-Thru RPG has their annual GM's Day Sale going on right now. It just started. So you can save 33% off and actually get the uh, supplement for $6.68. So as I'm talking about Remarkable Inns and their drinks, I do want to also point out that Yes, the GM Day Sale is going on. It runs for, I think, about another 10 and a half days. And get ready for it. There are over 40,000 items marked off at approximately 33%. So if you play role-playing games and you love your Game Master or you would like to get out of your doghouse that you may have found yourself in with your Game Master maybe this would be a good time. And whenever I talk about drive through RPG or any of the other drive through sites, I always mention, if you're heading over there, please stop at thegaminggang.com, click on one of our banners to take you to one of the drive through sites, and if you make a purchase, we get a small portion of that purchase. And you'd be amazed, it all really adds up. And not only does it help pay for the hosting for thegaminggang.com, a lot of times it allows me to pick up stuff to review that otherwise I wouldn't get a chance to take a look at. All right, so my final news piece, which is going to include a lot of opinion, is regarding the Fiasco, which is the Robotech RPG tactics game from Palladium Books, or as they tried to be, uh, Palladium Games. So, uh, this disaster has taken yet another turn, and it is one that has left Kickstarter backers furious. So, as I mentioned before, Russell Higgins is one of our live viewers right now, and yes, this is one of those kind of projects that makes people swear off Kickstarter for the rest of their lives. So I have to point out, 
few different things. So number one, luckily, tabletop, miniature gaming, all that kind of stuff, we're ahead of the curve as opposed to, let's say, backing a Kickstarter for a PC game or console game as far as actually receiving something for our pledges. Uh, I got to be very honest. If somebody told me, hey, you know, you should really back this PC game, I'd say, yeah, okay, I'll back it with your money. I'm not touching it. So anyway, so the whole story is basically that uh, Palladium founder and president Kevin Symbieta, I think that's how it's pronounced. I am going to refer to him like most people online refer to him as Uncle Kevin from here on out, simply so I don't have to continually butcher uh, his last name. Anyway, so he released an update on the Kickstarter after essentially years of deflecting blame on where was the Wave 2 uh, rewards that uh, were promised and had never, ever arrived and finally came out the other day and said, well, you're not going to get them. You're not going to see them. Now, the Robotech Tactics, uh, Robotech RPG Tactics Kickstarter was one of the first really big successful Kickstarters out there for a game. It brought in $1.44 million. Took forever for uh, Palladium to actually come about uh, fulfilling that Kickstarter. There was a, it was supposed to arrive in 2013. In fact, I believe the Wave 2 miniatures in that were supposed to arrive in 2013 as well. And uh, you don't have to you know, be a rocket scientist to calculate, well, uh, it's been almost five years. So anyway, so it, it collected $1.44 million. So effectively, Uncle Kevin, Uncle Kev, has said, well, you're not going to see this, and uh, we don't have any money. We don't have any money. Uh, what they are offering is if you want some of the Wave 1 product that is just sitting around and nobody wants, that uh, you can take whatever credit you happen to have that had not been fulfilled for the Wave 2 and uh, apply it to Wave 1, which uh, nobody actually wants because a lot of people were pretty disappointed with the quality of the sculpts on the miniatures themselves, on the mecha. So, uh, I want to share some opinion here, because I don't have, like, all the dope on this. There's a lot of hearsay, a lot of uh, lack of transparency, and I have to admit, uh, Kevin over at Palladium is one of these people who is uh, mostly reviled in the industry. It's always some scam with him. And now I know there are people out there, they will just eat broken glass before saying anything bad about Palladium. And because, you know, they like their riff system or whatever. And I'm familiar with Palladium from back in the day. I actually picked up the first Mechanoids trilogy that came out when it came out. And it was almost like digest sized. And I thought, wow, this is a cool setting. I thought the system was crap. And that is kind of uh, the whole vibe with Palladium stuff. Kind of cool ideas. System's kind of unplayable for the most part. So the first thing I want to say is uh, I'm really sorry for anyone who backed this project. I mean, by this point in time, you kind of knew this was not going to be fulfilled. So, ugh. and I have heard there were people who had hundreds upon hundreds of dollars or over a thousand dollars pledged into this. Well, that credit's available to you if you want the wave one stuff. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, Palladium doesn't have money to ship it from, I think, China. I'm not positive. I think it's from China. So effectively, about a hundred dollars of your credit would simply go to shipping alone. Yeah. Anyway, there were red flags all over this from the beginning. Now, Ninja Division was involved early on. I don't want to completely uh, eliminate any of their responsibilities they may have had. 
And I know Ninja Division was involved. They were going to basically run everything about the Kickstarter, but they had an escape clause with Palladium saying, hey, you know what? If after the funding is complete, we want to bail, we can bail. And they did. So the big question here is, where did all this money go? And this is sort of along the lines of, uh, gosh, I remember, uh, I can't even remember the, the company's name because they kept changing the name of the company, but it was Valley Games. Horror gamers are going to remember this because they were looking at, uh, they were kickstarting Upfront, which is a classic Avalon Hill World War II card game, kind of like a squad leader game, but card driven, which as soon as that was announced, I said, the, no way, they don't have the rights to it. They do not have the rights to actually publish this game, which it turned out they really didn't. They had the designer on board, but they really didn't have the rights. But by then it didn't matter because the owner of uh, Valley slash Revolution, no, maybe it wasn't Revolution, I forget. They kept changing the name of the company. Uh, they had another Kickstarter as well called uh, Airborne in Your Pocket, which was supposed to be like a dice game. And all in all, they, they brought in over a million bucks. And uh, in the end, the, uh, the criminal, basically, who was running that company, took off for Australia with the dough. Nobody got anything, right? Anyway, so the, the question I have is, because I've taken a look at kind of the numbers, and, and basically Uncle Kev over at Palladium is like, you know, we gave the old college try, and we did our best, and... Sorry, folks, that's bullshit. When you have a Kickstarter and you pull in $1.44 million, you better be doing a lot more than giving it the old college try. But even taking a look at the numbers that he, he floated out there publicly, it looks as if about five hundred to $600,000 had been spent on the first wave of the Robotech stuff. So... That leaves you to wonder, where's the other $800,000? Anyway, to wrap up, this is what I'm going to recommend. Anybody out there who did back the Kickstarter, sue. And I know there are people out there floating around online telling you, oh, no, you can't sue. Nobody's going to sue. Don't bother suing. I'm telling you right now, do not listen to them because I will guarantee you, because I told you, there's all these apologists for Palladium Games, which is for for years has always had a really shady way of operating uh but there are people out there who all they care about is oh well there's a new riff source book coming out i want to be able to get that book they don't care about your money they don't care about your kickstarter that you backed they don't care that you didn't get the merchandise that you paid for so they're like oh don't sue don't buy blah, blah. i saw somebody say oh well i sank 700 dollars into this and i'm i'm really not upset and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, sure thing. I'm buying that one. So anyway, so my recommendation is contact your state's attorney general. Contact their office. Find out what you might be able to do. You can always go through small claims court. Yes, I, I hate to break it to you. There's probably going to be some sort of a, a fee involved to try to file suit. But do not let Uncle Kev and Palladium off the hook on this because they screwed the pooch and there's money someplace. The money's not gone. And for folks out there, another thing I've heard floating around is, well, you know, the terms of service for Kickstarter, well, you know, they, there's never any kind of guarantee as far as you're going to receive something. So, you know, you can't really sue. Wrong. When this Kickstarter was in effect, there were different terms of service as far as Kickstarter so yes, you can sue. And I will point out that the legal system, the U.S. government looks at Kickstarter as if it's a store and you pay for a pre-order. So when they do not come through with providing you the product you paid for, you can sue. So don't sit back on your hands and say, oh, well, there goes 400 bucks or there goes 500 bucks. Be proactive. I mean, I'm serious. Put the put the feet to the fire for Palladium Games because don't let them walk away on this pocketing hundreds of thousands of dollars of your hard-earned cash. That is just my recommendation, just my opinion. 
And that is it for the news for the day. I'm done pontificating about Robotech RPG tactics. And once again, I am so sorry for folks out there who did back this and got screwed. But I will say I do not post Palladium game news, Palladium book news, whatever. I think the last time I ever posted anything from them was when Robotech was coming to Kickstarter. Oh, another thing I forgot. Palladium doesn't e won't even have the rights to do Robotech anymore anyway. They're losing the rights. I don't know if they decided they were not going to renew the rights with Harmony Gold because that would they thought maybe that lets them off the hook on this or something or if Harmony Gold decided they were pulling the license, they're not going to renew it. I don't know. Harmony Gold in itself who owns the rights to Robotech is a dumpster fire in itself too because they're not going to have the rights to the original three animes that they uh, dubbed and cut and strung together as Robotech in about three years. They'll lose the rights to that too. So anyway, as of now, Robotech's pretty much dead. Sorry, Robotech fans. Anyway, moving right along. Huh, man, that just... When I hear stuff like that, that really just mm, frosts my butt, you know? I, I hate scam artists I, I, that just irritates me. And then to have people who are apologists or possibly people masquerading as just regular gamers saying, oh, no, it's not Palladium's fault. It's it's China's fault. It, and, and, you know, if you want to look into all the details about this, it's just... How do you... How do you how do you do business like that? I just, I don't understand. I mean, I don't, I don't really run a business, you know, the gaming gang.com. Yeah, sure. I get advertising money and stuff like that, but I don't, you know, and I wouldn't run the gaming gang like Palladium's been run. So, all right. Anyway, so I'm going to jump into the mailbag real quick, and then I'm going to talk about uh, what's coming up on the show. So anyway, uh, very, very quickly, I had, uh, I had mentioned yesterday, I was talking, there, somebody had, had actually emailed me at mailbag, doc, or I'm sorry, mailbag at thegaminggang.com asking about, you know, what uh, what war game reviewers did I watch and, you know, who I'd want to sit down, play a game with, have a beer with, you know, what have you. And uh, I said, well, I really don't follow anybody, any other reviewers, but I have seen stuff. And I had mentioned, well, you know, Marco, uh, Marco Wargamer, uh, who's popular with wargaming fans. I said he was really rude to me at, at Gen Con. He was rude to Elliot and I at Gen Con when we basically said hello. We were sitting at a table next to him. And uh, I got a couple of emails and people were like, hey, you know, sh shut the F up about Marco. What right do you have to say anything about Marco? His videos get way more views than you'll ever get. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so I had prefaced yesterday that well, you know, everybody has a bad day. Maybe we caught them on a bad day. Uh, I wasn't like saying, oh, yeah, uh, you know, burn this guy in effigy or something like that. Uh, but I was just sharing my personal experience. And someone else on that video on YouTube shared a very similar experience. And I didn't even get into detail about the person Marco was sitting with who he was exceptionally rude to. But anyway, so uh, I'm sort of like, Okay, well, you know, whatever. I'm just sharing my personal experience. I, I met the guy one time. Just like I've met Will Wheaton a few times. A couple of times, he's been sweeter than pie. He's, he's really cool. He's kind of joking around. And I've run into him when he's, you know, in like a mood or something. Whatever, it's just, it just happens, right? So the other thing was, uh, and I have the impression that although these two emails came from different email addresses, they were very similar in tone. And they also both included, well, you know, nobody watches your videos. Why don't you just hang it up? Nobody's, nobody's watching the Daily Dope. Big deal. Whatever. So my response to that is, you know what? It's not that big a deal. I am not flipping out. Wow, you know, this video got 150 views, but then this video only got 30 views. It's Rome wasn't built in a day. I don't expect people to be flocking to the show because it is very conversational. It's it's very different. It's not just somebody sitting here, okay, we're going to talk about this game, boom, done. Or maybe here's the news, here's the news, here's the news, here's an unboxing, and I'm done. I'm very chatty. I'm very conversational. It's just the way it goes. But I'll tell you what. 
I'm not hanging it up because I get emails or comments from people who say, hey, you know, you cracked that joke about whatever. And man, that really, really made me bust out laughing. And that that made my day or I had somebody who emails and, or comments and said, hey, you know, I caught your review of XYZ game. I picked it up. We played it, had a blast. Thanks so much for sharing that. They obviously watched the video question from Russell Higgins. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Uh, the people who commented, I can't tell you. Maybe they heard through the grapevine or something that I said something about Marco not being a friendly guy. I don't know. I don't care. To be honest, that's the other thing. I don't care. Anyway, I have a good time doing this. I'm sharing info. Uh, it's not brain surgery. It's not, or I like to say it's not rocket surgery. Nobody's going to die. So if you disagree with my opinions, that's fine. It's, I'm just sharing an opinion. I'm just sharing experiences and things like that. But the thing that really makes me smile is when I get an email from somebody saying, hey, you know, I had a bad day and sat down and I watched you talk about XYZ game. And I was like, wow, you know, I really want to get that game. And hey, you know, really cheered me up. I was, you know, maybe I was bumming out. That's cool. I mean, to me, that's worth it. I mean, all the work and stuff that goes into providing... This show, Monday through Friday, plus all the stuff I do on thegaminggang.com. When I hear stuff like that, it's like, yeah, you made my day or you made me smile. It makes it all worthwhile. So sorry, I'm not going to be hanging it up simply because, you know, I don't get 10,000 views on a video. Sorry. All right, moving right along. Let's, uh, let's cheer things up a little bit. Boy, I <clears throat> kind of got a little riled up on that Kickstarter from... From Palladium. All right. So before I jump into Hero Realms, so tomorrow, uh, the kind folks over at Daily Magic Games sent me Songbird, and it's a little card game, and I'm gonna get this to the table tonight. So originally I was just going to just do an unboxing, but I'm gonna get to play it tonight. So I'm gonna make sure it, I, it doesn't look like it takes long to play. 20 minutes maybe is my guess I don't know watch it turns out it's like a five hour game but uh, so I figure I've got to review every day this week right pretty wild I don't think I've yet to do a review every day of the week so why stop now let's make it five for five so I will be reviewing Songbird uh, on tomorrow's show Monday, Tuesday, I'm still kind of up in the air. I just said I'm going to, in fact, I pulled it off the shelf and I put it off to the side. I will do a review of Evolution. In fact, the this is the most recent edition of Evolution. So we'll take a look at that. It'll be either Monday or Tuesday. Wargame Wednesday, I know I've got uh, a lot of Wargamers and big thanks to them. The big thanks to everybody who watches this show. I'm not just trying to, you know, uh, single out the Wargamers. But I will be doing an unboxing of At Any Cost Mets 1870, designed by my good pal Herman Lutman and released from GMT Games. So that'll be on Wednesday. And then I will fill in the other days as well because I never know what's popping up in the mail. I mean, there's times that I'm doing the news, getting ready for the news because that's the first thing I do for the, the show every morning. And UPS suddenly shows up with a box and I'm like, whoa, cool. All right, so as I mentioned before, I am going to review Hero Realms from White Wizard Games. And we played quite a lot of this over the weekend, I have to admit. And it's, uh, it's, it's a fun game. It is designed by Robert Doherty and Darwin Castle. It's for two to four players, ages 12 and up. It plays in around 20 to 30 minutes. Now, the MSRP on the core game is 1999 and uh it originally came out in 2016 so this game has been out for a little bit so let's switch on over to the other camera and i've kind of laid the game out a bit and this is a, this is a pretty quick moving game so uh, i'm going to go into a, a little bit of detail we're going to look at some of the cards i'm going to explain some of the concepts in that i'm not necessarily going to like play a game of it to player against each other so you've got the rules here and the rules are basically just one fold out sheet two sides 
anyone who has played uh, a variety of deck building games and maybe a little bit of magic or some of the other kind of uh, card based kind of dueling games, battling games, this is going to be very, very easy to jump into. So I first started off by playing with my 16 year old nephew, Cameron, who's a member of the gang. Everybody knows that. And he doesn't have a ton of experience with deck builders. Tried to get into a magic with him a little bit a couple of years ago. And he just had a really difficult time wrapping his head around it. Because it was actually one of the first games that he was kind of learning how to play. So I was very, very pleased to see how quickly he picked right up on this game. Granted, some of the strategies, some of the little nuances of the design... I don't think he grasped those uh, right away, but then again, wasn't expecting it. So what you're gonna do, I've got this kind of set up as a two player game. Normally you would have way more space. I just kind of crammed things in a little bit here. So when you set up the game, each of the players is going to have their starting 10 card deck. Pretty standard deck building stuff, right? So you're gonna have a dagger, you're going to have a short sword, you're going to have a ruby, and you're going to have seven individual gold piece cards. All the artwork on the gold is all duplicates here. So you've got some cards that are allow going to allow you to spend, and then you've got some cards that will provide you with an attack. So as we see here, the ruby is going to get you two gold. The gold is going to get you a single gold. Playing the short sword gets you an attack of two. And playing a dagger will give you an attack of one. In just the standard game, each of the players will start with 50 health. And you can either, if you want, you can just track your health on a piece of paper. Or you also have these kind of cool little cards here. That you can actually just, they're a little tracker card. So starting off at 50, you'd be like that. Let's say you got knocked down to 46. You're simply going to do this. You have 46. Oh, well, I'm down to 31. And so on. Pretty easy. Very easy to track. Uh, I thought it was funny because Cameron's like, wow, that's really cool. And it's like, all right, it's not that cool. I mean, it's nice, nice little addition, though, to be honest, rather than having to, you know, scratch out stuff on a piece of paper constantly. Right, so you'll have that, you'll have your starting deck, and then you're going to set up the market. So as with most deck building games, you're going to have an opportunity to purchase cards during your turn. So when you first start, the first player is going to get to draw three cards from their deck. So of course we got 10 cards to start the deck. First player is gonna get three cards Second player is going to get five. And then from there on out, you're always going to have five cards as your draw. Let's say one, two, three. There we go. So first player, let's say that's a blue player. Blue player gets ruby, gold, gold. There's four gold they can spend. Now looking at some of the cards, kind of the breakdown of the cards, you're going to see here, first off, in the upper left corner, you've got the faction. So this is the guild faction. So these are kind of like assassins, bureaucrats. Usually with the guild, you're going to find that uh, there's money involved in these guild cards. So as an example here, we've got this card is a profit card. So right there, upper left corner, we got the blue background with the black iconography, or I should say like a black bag icon. Then you're gonna see in the upper right corner, that's the cost to purchase the card. Simple enough. Then we got the artwork. I have to say, and, and Cameron and his friends were very impressed too, really dug the artwork. I thought the artwork was very, very nicely done. Not a lot of duplicates. I mean, it's, it's only duplicated if it's a duplicate card. And there are quite a lot of cards in this game. Uh, I think overall the market deck consists of I think it's a 120, 100 cards, something like that. 104, maybe? I don't know. I could probably look at the back of the box and it would tell me. 
Okay, so then next thing you're going to see is right below the image. Well, here up top, it's going to tell you, okay, profit is the name of the card, and it's an action. So you're going to have actions, you're going to have champions. So you're going to have things that are kind of actions. You can have spells, which are an action. You can have taxation, where you're getting more gold. That's considered an action. These cards, when it's an action, it's basically you play it during your turn, then it's done, and it goes into your discard. So down here, we're going to see, okay, well, this is what happens when I play this card. So when I play this card, this card gets me two gold. It's profit, right? Okay, so I'm earning a profit. But you'll also see that there is, at the bottom, you'll see there's an icon. So it's an icon that shows the guild, and then it shows an attack of four. What that means is, during that turn, if you have another card of the guild faction, you will get to add four to your combat total. And the combat total is kind of just a, a pool, a combat pool that you get. So that's kind of that card here. Oh, there we go. Look, taxation right there. So taxation. Now this is a different, uh, different faction. This faction is the Empire. So you'll see this faction will have uh, more champions in it. It's uh, kind of like, uh, I guess we would say kind of like the human empire, kind of like a fantasy empire, right? So you're going to see that this would cost, if it's in the market, it would cost you one gold. So when you would play this card, you would get two gold. And there's that ally ability down there. So if you happen to play this card and you also have another Empire card in play on that turn, you'll gain six health. That little green bottle means that you get health back. All right, so here we've got the Rot. So this is another faction. These are the Necros. Uh, yeah, that does sound kind of weird to call them like Necros, right? Puts kind of a weird image in my head so uh let's say uh kind of more like the necromancer or uh undead <laughs> faction right all right so it's showing that this is an action it's a curse it's going to cost you three gold to purchase this card if it was in the market it's going to tell you okay so what are what does it say right there so it says get you get four you get four added to your combat pool, and it says you may sacrifice a card in your hand or discard pile. Keep in mind, this is a deck building game. And, and this is a concept that uh, Cameron and his friends seem to kind of have a little trouble with sometimes. Where it's when, in a deck building game, once you get your deck kind of going, kind of getting it to the point where you want it, that's when you start culling out cards that are very weak because it's just, you know, extra chafe. It's bloat in your deck. You're trying to shave that bloat off. Sure, yeah, a gold card for one gold is great in the beginning when you get a few of them because you need to buy stuff. But then as the game progresses and you have other cards that provide you with bigger gold bonuses, then you don't really want the gold. So this actually allows you to sacrifice a card and sacrificing a card just means it's removed from play. It's removed from the game. You'll normally have a little kind of pile over here that you'll take cards that you sacrifice. And then once again, we take a look. There's the ally ability. So if you had somebody from the uh, <clears throat> undead faction, you would be able to add an additional three to your combat pool. All right, so then we've got a champion. And this is another card from the Empire, and it's Man at Arms. And if you take a look, it'll say Champion Human Warrior. It costs three to purchase. And you'll see here that there's that little arrow icon. Now, I know that companies cannot utilize a word like tap because Wizards of the Coast owns copyright on that. I can say tap. So effectively, what it's, what it's saying is that if you activate this card, so you're going to turn the card and show that you've activated it, it is going to add three to your combat pool. 
Then the bottom thing says, uh, oh, yeah, okay. And then plus one for every guard you have in play. So this is a champion. So when this gets, this card gets played out of your hand on a turn, they will actually stay on the table. They are in play. It's a, a champion, a hero that you have recruited. And you'll see that these champions will have in the lower right corner, they're going to have a shield. And that shield is either going to be white and it'll have a number in it. That effectively just says, well, that's how much damage that hero, that champion can soak up before it goes into your discard pile. But you'll see if you've got a guard, the guard means that this champion has to be attacked before any other champion that you have in front of you. Which is pretty cool because sometimes you'll have some of the like, yeah, so some of the weaker champions, some of the low cost champions, and they don't have a guard ability. And they may only have a defense of, you know, two, three. And early in the game, it'd be pretty easy to just knock them off when you get one of those short swords or daggers or what have you. So what the guard does is the guard soaks up that that combat pool that's being thrown at that player first. So if you have more than one guard, both of those guards have to be uh, attacked before anybody else can. So that's that. All right, and then we got another another card here, uh, another Empire card. Oh, shoot, I should have grabbed something. Well, we'll take a look at the, take a look at the uh, market down here in just a second. Once again, another card that says, okay, so this is uh, an Empire card, cost three, it's closed ranks. It's gonna add to your combat pool. It's gonna give you an extra combat factor for every champion you have in play. And then if you have an Empire card, now keep in mind, that's just an Empire card. That is not an Empire champion. Any kind of Empire card in play will also heal you six. And you can have more than 50 health. And then uh, we got another, another champion. So we got another champion here. So a little bit more expensive. It's a five, costs you five to purchase. And it's talking about, okay, this is the special ability. And then the ally ability. Now, some of these cards are going to give you uh, an either or. And I will show you that in just a second. So there are two. Uh, no, there's only one other faction that I haven't talked about. And that's kind of the wild faction, kind of the nature faction. And they'll have this green circle in the upper left. So this is nature's bounty. So it costs you four to buy. And when you play it, you're going to get four. You're going to get four gold. Then you can see that it has, if you have another wild card in play, you can make your opponent discard a card from their hand. And then you can sacrifice this card. And you'll see there's kind of like a trash can icon on it. If you sacrifice it, if you remove this card from play, you can also get an additional four added to your combat pool that round. Then we got kind of the either or. So we've got this priest here. And for the most part, you can kind of look at this where before you get to the ally, right? So down here, we've got the ally. You know, the top portion is, you know, what does that card do? And then the bottom portion of some cards, not every card, will have something from that faction saying, oh, this is what you get to do. It's not either or, it's both. You get to do both. So you could activate this champion to get the two added to your combat pool. And if you happen to have another wild faction card, then you get to draw a card. It's the Orc Grunt. But here's one of the cards that's kind of an either-or card, right? So you play this, you're either going to get one gold or you can gain one health for every champion you have in play. It's an either-or. Now you see he's got the three in that shield, but it's, it's kind of a white background. I guess we would say silver, really. He's not a guard. 
All right, so. So the way the game would progress is uh, the first player gets their three cards, right? What did I pull? Didn't I pull a gold, a gold, and... Where did I put them? <laughs> I got cards all over the place. Where did I put those cards? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I know I drew them. What did I do with them? I bet I put them on this stack, right? No, I did not. Ah, for crying out, Jeff. Crying out loud, Jeff. Did I put it under, on, under there? Am I talking over here and I moved them? All right, whatever. <laughs> Steal them out of these. So you can have up to four players in the game. And there are different options as far as uh, team play. You can play just a free-for-all. So you, can have, you could have two, three, or four players playing as a free-for-all. You've got uh, team play, two-on-two. -two. Pretty cool. All right, so this is what I had drawn from this, this hand here, right? Didn't I draw? Yep. So effectively, on the first turn out, the first player gets to draw the three cards. So they're going to say, okay, I've got four gold. This is the marketplace. So we've got nature's bounty is two, bribe is three, the, uh, uh, what is it, a tithe, I believe it's called, uh, two, orc runs a three, and life drains a six. Now, you'll also have a stack of these fire gems off to the side. And these fire gems cost two gold to purchase. One played, you can get two gold, or you can sacrifice it to add an additional three to your combat pool. So these are always available. And if they get sacrificed, they're not actually removed from play. They'll just go back on this stack. So uh, players say, okay, well, I got the four gold. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I am going to buy uh, the priest for two. So whenever you make your purchase, you're going to take the card, and then you're going to draw another new card from the deck here. So the important reason why you want to remember to do that is because you may draw a card that you're going to purchase afterwards. So for an example here, I spent two. We got four, three, three, and six. I only have two gold left. I wouldn't be able to buy anything else. I would probably end up buying the fire gem for the, my leftover two. Well, in this situation, well, I replace this card. I've got spark, which gives me, which only costs me one. So I might say, okay, well, I'm going to buy that. And then I'm going to flip over the next one. Okay, well, this one costs three, so I know I can't get that. So I'm going to take my cards, just like a standard deck builder. You're going to take the cards that you played. You're going to take the cards that you purchased. They go in your discard. Then it's the next player's turn. So the next player, second player here, he's going to take five cards. So we've got the five cards. Because remember, you only take three cards if you're the first player. All right, so he says, okay, so I've got one gold. I've got three, four, five, six gold. I got six gold. All right, cool. So I can spend six. Now they're going to make their purchases. They're going to say, okay, well, maybe I want to go with, uh, I'm going to take this card here, Life Drain. Because Life Drain gives you eight additional combat to your pool. All right, so then you will replace that. He spent all his gold. He's going to take his cards that he just spent and the new card he got, and boom, that's his discard. Then, of course, you're going to, you're going to draw from the cards from your deck that you haven't used yet, and like a traditional deck-building game, you're going to continue to, to take your cards that you purchased, put them in your discard pile. When you don't have any cards left in your deck, you're going to shuffle up your discard and start again. So you're going to go through your, your early deck quite a few times. So eventually it gets to the point where... Let's grab some of these champions. All right, so let's grab this guy here. What else we got? Let's look in the deck. What else we got? Uh, all right. Got Kron the Berserker. I'm going to show off how you'll have some of these, which are 
how the factions kind of feed off each other, or f feed off themselves, I should say. Okay. And let's just take a gold coin for the hell of it. All right, so say... Then suddenly you got, okay, so uh, we've been playing for a little bit. Nobody's got any champions out. And then the player draws his hand. So they've got one gold. They've got, they get this intimidation card. So they're going to play that intimidation card. So that intimidation card is going to give them five to their combat pool. So you're going to have five. Then they say, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to play Borg Orc Mercenary who is a champion, so this, this card is going to stay out in play. Now, right away we see, okay, so that is part of the guild. This card is also the guild, so we get that special ability. So that's going to activate that, because now we have another guild card in play. So not only am I going to have the five combat, I'm also going to get this bonus. So now I've actually got three gold I can spend... Then I say, okay, well, I'm going to play the Lore Weaver, who is another champion. And I can actually utilize this. I can activate that card to get two more gold, which is going to give me... Now I've got five gold I can spend. Still got my fifth card. I play the fifth card, and I get Kron the Berserker. And we see here, I get to draw a card because that is the faction, that is the ally ability. I already have the one wild card out here, right? So that's going to allow me to draw an additional card from my deck. Plus, this card here also had the ability to make a target opponent discard a card from their hand. So I could have done this. All right, so I've got that. So wow, now I got another card from my deck. Let's just pretend that's the deck. And I played this, yet another champion. So how this would all resolve is I've got the five gold I could spend. I say, okay, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to take these, this card here, replace it. Uh, and then I'm going to take this card here. These are just as examples, folks. <laughs> so I would have spent my five gold. Now, I have to think about, okay, so I'm attacking my opponent. What have I got available to me? All right, so I've got this Intimidation, which gives me five. I can activate the Ogre Mercenary. That's going to give me nine. I've got the Berserker. I'm going to activate that. That's going to give me 14. And then I'm going to use the Vampire here. Activate him. Also, getting the ability to possibly, if I want to, I can sacrifice a card for my hand or discard. Or I should say, yeah, for my hand or discard pile. And if I did that, I get an additional bonus. So I'm at 17, and the additional bonus on this would be 3? Kind of small. It's like a 3, right? So we've got five, nine. This brings me up to 14, 17. So I have 17 points in my combat pool. I would choose an opponent. And for an example, let's say that these are the champions who are on the other side of the table that I'm facing, right? So let's say I've got the 17 points of combat pool. So really what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, well, I'm attacking my opponent. And then the opponent is going to be the one who goes, oh, okay, well, kind of a little bit like magic, right? You've got your blockers. So we know this is a guard. So six of those points in the combat pool are going to, are going to go towards the guard. So he's going to be eliminated with six. That's going to leave me with 11. That's like, well, okay, uh lose the lore weaver so that's six that's gonna leave me five well guess what i can apply it to one of these these champions here five isn't gonna knock them out because they both have a defense of six you have to equal or exceed the defense to 
uh, it's what they call stun. You stun that champion. So you, what you do is you're actually taking that champion off of the table and that card is gonna go back into your discard. It's gonna go into your discard pile. So eventually, as the game continues, you're gonna reshuffle your discards and more than likely, you're gonna get that card again. You're gonna get that hero, that champion again to bring into play. Once you've done that, you're gonna end your turn. All you're really gonna do is you're just going to uh, kind of refresh the cards that you had <clears throat> activated <laughs> by turning. Then you're gonna draw five new cards. You always end your turn by driving, uh, drawing five new cards because as you saw, one of the cards that I utilized would force my opponent to discard a card. So that means that when it was their turn again, they're going to play that next turn at a disadvantage. So it's very possible you could have a hand where not only are you banging away at your opponent with the combat pool, but you're also forcing them to discard cards out of their hand so when it comes to their turn, maybe they only get four cards to play or three cards to play. So it's very, very important to always remember that you're drawing your five cards at the end of the turn. So let's say for an example, that previous attack that I was talking about. So we had five points left. Let's say I didn't have any more champions left, right? And I'm the blue player, simple enough. So those five points would be applied to me and I would drop down to 45 health and you're on to the next turn. So you're gonna continue playing until, if you're playing a two player game, until there's all, you know, you've knocked your opponent out. And basically, I know most people play in magic and that is like, well, you got 20 health in that. And here you're like 50 health to start off. Holy cow, that's a lot of health. That, this game must pay, take forever. Nope, it certainly does not, because this is a very fast playing, very bang, bang, slam, bang kind of game. Uh, you're, you're really always on the attack. Not a lot of turtling up. You're not trying to do a lot of defensive stuff. It's all pretty much take that, boom. And it's funny because I, I was playing Cameron and in a couple of games, one game, he didn't have any champions out. He didn't have any champions in front of him to block any uh, attacks. And on one turn, out of just the five cards that I drew in that hand, I was able to hit him for 28 points of damage. And it was funny because I was down to nine points of health and he had something like 46 by that point in the game. And I ended up turning it around and won that game. Uh, sometimes if, if there's a lot of health cards, a lot of the, the little green vials that give you health, health, playing a lot of that, sometimes the game may kind of go a little bit longer, but really two players, once you get the hang of the game, it's really fast. You can really knock it out in about 20 minutes. A little less than that sometimes if, uh, if your opponent's not having a lot of luck, they're not drawing a lot of champions to block some pretty powerful attacks. Because as you saw, there was a card that I bought that right off the bat does eight points, has eight points to your, to your combat pool. So very, very quick playing. Uh, plays really well with multiple players too, I have to point out. Uh, I have played Magic, well, okay, so I haven't played a lot of Magic in the past few years, but when Magic first came out, if you watch the show, I've already talked about how Ellie and I were playing when it was in beta, when the beta sets were out. Team Magic can be kind of tough. Now, I have not, is it, I believe it's Commander, which is kind of focused more on team play. But traditionally, Team Magic really kind of dragged. Playing Hero Realms, four-player four game, everybody is free-for-all, very, very quick still going to finish up and once everybody knows how to play finish up in eh, 30 35 minutes tops i'm talking tops so a few things that uh are pretty apparent when you're playing the game is of course 
You don't want to be just sitting there grabbing every faction and things like that. You want to try to maybe in your deck focus on a couple of factions so you can use those different ally abilities. I found myself a lot of times going with the uh, the Empire and the Wild, which is weird because it's almost like a white green, which is sort of what I played in Magic. I usually played a white green deck. <laughs> I don't know why it worked out that way. So uh like this a lot the gang loved this game because it was super easy to jump into and learn even one of the other uh players who also happens to be named cameron strangely enough not my nephew but a friend of my nephew's he plays magic i don't know how much he plays or how well he plays magic he really dug it so very, very cool. The other thing I want to show you too is that White Wizard Games also has uh, special character decks and boss decks available. And they change up the, the gameplay a little bit. And so for an example, uh, White Wizard was kind enough to send me the uh, boss deck for the dragon. So in the boss deck, you get... Just a new rule sheet talking about some of the tweaks that you're going to make. Talking about the dragon rules here. And then they sent me the Lich deck. So these are the Lich rules here. And the cool thing about these decks is the character decks, they sent um, a fighter, a wizard, ranger, cleric, and thief. I think that's all they've got. I'm not sure all the expansions that might be available for hero realms but you can actually play if you take a look here this is kind of the suggested kind of setup you can actually play six players so one player is playing the boss monster and the other players are playing the characters and they actually suggest okay so sit in this order around the table because all the all the characters will get to take their turn first and then the boss gets to take their turn. And it's really cool because it's uh, it's kind of set up where, like for an example, uh, the dragon, the dragon is based on, you know, the health is based on how many players are fighting the dragon. The, the lich has these soul jars. And I'm going to show you, I'll show you kind of the lich here. So lich has these soul jars, which the soul jars are actually the lich's health. So a bit different than having this card here. And then you'll have these various different cards. Now you'll see, just like before, we're seeing that these cards give abilities, but there's no faction. Well, the faction actually here is the Lich. If you look in the corner, it shows a Lich. But there's no cost associated with it. So these are like the soul jars. And then the Lich has his own deck with all these new different minions of course there's gold and it's really cool how you incorporate this into hero realms uh especially when people are like well you know we've we've played the four four player two on two enough times get to try something a bit different so this is the cleric deck so the cleric deck so the cleric has her own special card right there's the cleric and you've got male and female and then right here it'll say okay so you get to start with 55 health so the different characters start with different health so you would have your 50 55 just like that and then once again now we've got these different cards now the wizard as well as the thief also have an additional card which is uh kind of like special rules for them just to give you kind of an idea of what the oh the ranger does too so this is an example of the rules for the ranger I'll tell you right there and then it uh it helps you out because you'll see that the card backings now the heroes all have the same kind of card backing but for an example, uh, the dragon has for the dragons, 
uh, treasures, different card back, as far as the Lich with those soul, uh, soul, um, uh, soul jars. I almost said vials. The soul jars, you see that they've got a different back to it. So I always say, here's the Ranger. So the Ranger is saying, okay, the Ranger gets 58. Scan. Got different options, male, female. And then you've got the Ranger's deck. It's cool because he's put a new wrinkle into the game. Uh, so once you, you've you kind of uh, gotten your head around Hero Realms, like I said, it takes very, you know, I think five minutes tops to figure it out. Probably even less if you've played some magic and you've played some deck building games. When I say deck building games, I'm even talking about like Clank, a deck building adventure. Uh, it doesn't have to be like a real heavy, like Thunderstone kind of deck building experience that you need to really just jump right in and start playing this. But once you've played the uh, standard core box for Hero Realms and you want something a little bit different, you can start looking at these character decks and these boss decks. Now the character decks are $4.99 and the boss decks are $9.99. And as I mentioned, I'm not sure exactly how many expansions there might be for Hero Realms. But overall, that is pretty much how to play the game. Easy peasy, folks. I'm telling you, this is, I, I, I gotta be honest. I mean, I started smiling when right away, Cameron's like, oh yeah, I got it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I remember this from that one other deck building game. I think he'd mentioned, oh yeah, this is kind of like Clank or uh, like um, Legendary Aliens. And I said, yeah, it's kind of, it's a deck builder thing, right? You're, you're buying cards, you're building your deck, you're using the deck. Oh yeah, okay, cool. So liked it a lot. Uh, and it's funny because when I first saw it, because uh, I've heard a lot of really awesome stuff about Star Realms, but I hadn't heard a lot about Hero Realms. So a lot of times, sometimes when a game kind of flies under the radar, or maybe, you know, maybe it only flew under my radar, I don't know. But a lot of times, then it's kind of like, hmm, well, is it not as good as Star Realms? Is that why I really hadn't heard about it? Because, like I said, I've, I've heard... I have never played it. I've actually never even really seen it up close uh, outside of the White Wizard Games booth at... Uh, I want to say it was at Origins. We kind of passed by. So, I was uh, very, very pleasantly surprised. All in all, uh, especially if you... Now, uh, I will point out that, okay, Hero Realms may not be for the folks who are, like, diehard magic fans. They're going to they're, they're gonna feel that it might be a little too simplistic for their tastes, and I understand that. I get that. So I would, I would definitely not argue with someone who plays a ton of Magic the Gathering trying to twist their arm saying, no, 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 you should really be playing Hero Realms. But then again, for people who like deck-building games, who people like... You know, like magic, but sometimes you want something a little bit different, something a little quicker, maybe a little more dirty. Down and dirty, take a little of that with you. Hero Realms is really going to fit the bill. Like I said, really, really enjoyed it. Everybody in the gang dug it. We played it a bunch over the weekend because I had lots of gaming going on this past weekend, both Friday and Saturday. So I have to say, all in all, I give the core core box, well, yeah, I'll say the core box because uh, the the character decks, the the boss decks, that's kind of separate. Uh, I will say the core game, I definitely give a very very solid eight point eight. In my opinion, it is that good. It's very, uh, it makes an excellent introduction to a deck building sort of game. It's a good way to get people's feet wet on maybe a collectible card game level. Uh, if, uh, and if, of course, if some of those collectible card games, which this is not a collectible card game, everything's in the box. If some of those collectible card games just seem to be a little too rules heavy for you, by all means, Hero Realms is excellent. Now, the character decks and the boss decks, uh, we didn't play as much with those 
but it is they are very cool they do change some of the dynamics of the game because of course it's just everybody going after the boss i of course had to play the boss monster just how it works and i won <laughs> anyway i won as the lich uh i thought that is a very very cool addition as well so if you dig hero realms then definitely experiment a little bit with uh picking up uh one of the bosses and maybe a couple of the characters to kind of introduce yourself to that wrinkle so i would say even including the characters and the boss monsters yeah stick to an 8.8 .8. so awesome all right so that is hero realms from white wizard games i did mention before it does carry an msrp of 19.99 for the core game i think that is a really good value i really do uh, i dug the art the the card stock is really nice of course if you're gonna play a lot sleeve the cards you know how that goes and there's a ton of gameplay packed into a $20 MSP, MSRP, I should say. That said, I do know, because it's been out for a while, some online retailers do have it for under $14. And I would say if you're interested whatsoever in what I've talked about during this review, it is a steal at $14. Bucks. Be sure, pick it up, uh, especially if you're, you know, working with like an online retailer who has free shipping at a certain level and you, you you're you kind of like, ah, oh, man, I still, I need one more game to get that free shipping. Yeah, it, like a $20 game, $15 game. Definitely snag Hero Realms. It's that good. Really, really cool. I hope maybe I get a chance to take a look at Star Realms because I've heard just stellar things about st Star Realms. That's kind of funny, stellar Star Realms. All right, so another jam-packed show. Gosh, I went like an hour 45 yesterday. Today, I'm going an hour and a half. So uh, thanks for watching. Most definitely, if you dig the gaming gang and you dig the Daily Dope videos, by all means, be sure to subscribe. Uh, if you dig the Daily Dope, or I should say, if you dig the gaming gang, certainly uh, follow on Twitter. You can follow us on Facebook, but... I just repost stuff on Facebook. I'm not very active on Facebook. But when you are not watching The Daily Dope, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com. I was just talking about it. For all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV, you know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff MacLear. Tomorrow I will review Songbirds from Daily Magic Game. Until, I'm sorry, Daily Magic Games, uh, plural. Jeez, Jeff, what are you, a dummy? Anyway, as I said, I'll be back tomorrow. Until then, enjoy the rest of your Thursday.